Welcome back to the Nihilist Media Podcast. This is Batty for Batman. I'm Mark. And I'm Colin. And today is a very special day. I get to talk about one of my favorite Batman pieces of media, and that is Batman Forever. Uh, right off the bat, I'm going to hate with a controversial opinion, is that I like Batman Forever more than I like Batman 89. It's my uh, it's one of my favorite live action Batman films. Uh, it's behind obviously The Dark Knight, Batman Begins, and Batman Returns, but it's right up there with those mm-hmm. those three. I absolutely love this movie. I think it's highly underrated, and it's one of the funnest superhero films I can think of that isn't directed by Sam Raimi. Cool. So you were saying that how Joel Schumacher got this job is in an interview with Burton, he said his favorite, if he was to adapt a Batman thing, it would be uh, Batman Year One. Yeah. So what happened? I mean, in the original in the original film that Schumacher directed, there is a lot more Year One elements. And he's basically, he. what he did was he had a, like, there's a lot of scenes that are deleted that you can look up on YouTube where Batman is having inner conflicts with himself and being like, is this all this is? Alfred is a scared bo- little boy running away from a monster in the dark, mm-hmm. you know? And, like, there was a lot more focus on the book and Bruce's trauma as a child because neither Burton films that, like, cared about mm-hmm. Bruce as a character. And then that's basically the whole the whole struggle is, is he Batman bound by his guilt or is he Batman because he chooses to be Batman because it's the right thing to do? And the whole thing is, like, when he was a kid, he reads in the book... Um, Bruce want, is insisting on seeing a movie. We want to stay in, and he has that whole guilt that I killed my parents. But then later on, he reads the di- uh, the diary again, and it doesn't say that at all. It was him projecting, and he but he ends up in the hole where he was, where he met the bat the first time, and he becomes one, he becomes Batman forever. Mm-hmm. And coming to terms of the fact that he's murdered people, and he even has there's even like a scene. I think it's in the actual film where he tells Dick like, "What are you gonna do if you kill Harvey? Like, you, you, like after once you kill Harvey, it doesn't take away the pain. You'll go out and night looking for another face and another and another, just like Keaton did throughout the entire uh, first two Burton films. So I think I think he did do achieve what he wanted to what, what wanted to do, but you know through recutting because you know once. No director was ever going to have free creative control following Batman Returns at that time. Mm-hmm. There was no way you were going to get that final cut, and Joel did not have that final cut. And Joel, there, like everyone says, that there is a much darker version of that film in the vaults of Warner Brothers. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying is release the Schumacher cut. I am definitely saying release the Schumacher cut. Mm. I think that Joel could have made one of the best Batman movies. I think if. From everything I've read about the cut, everything I've seen in the cut, and the the Danny Elfman music, the way they put Danny Elfman's music usually in those scenes, I think it rivals Returns as the best of this series. Mm-hmm. But you know, Joel also wasn't the like the first choice from the studio or Burton. Uh, one person, one director that was actually ironically considered was uh sam raimi Mm -hmm. he was the he was the uh the main one and then uh john mctiernan i don't know if you know who john mctiernan is i am well aware of who john mctiernan is one of my favorite action film directors he was also he was also have you you heard me talk about predator i have it's one of my favorite fucking movies ever man well he's not like a name he's not like a big name director (laughs) yeah there's a reason that's because he went to fucking prison yeah (laughs) Um, anyone who knows action movies should know Predator and should know the follow-up, which is Die Hard. And then the like, follow-up to that, Hunt of Red October, which is also mm-hmm. fucking phenomenal. Uh, yeah, I always stick with, like, Predator and, like, Die Hard because he did those, like, back-to-back, like, so quickly when he was so young. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy shit, man. And he also did, uh, instead of doing this film, because he ended up turning it down, or Bur- they, the studio decided that uh, Joel was the better choice, he ended up doing Die Hard 3, which is... A much better movie, mm-hmm. which actually ha- also had a villain that would have made a great Riddler, Jeremy Irons. Mm-hmm. Um, so originally Keaton loved Joel's take, 
he was very excited to do the film, and Rene Russo was going to be Chase Meridian, and then that all got thrown out the window when Keaton decided he didn't want to do it. He turned down $15 million mm-hmm. to do this. I don't know about you, but if someone offered me $15 million to be in this movie, I don't think I would have turned it down. Mm-hmm. We'll get Dan on the phone. We'll yeah. See we can, see I don't know. Like, like, I, feel like, I feel like, like it's like script-wise, it's not as bad as like... Especially if you're getting paid that much, it's not like oh, this is embarrassingly awful. No, but I mean, you don't know where he is in his life at that's, that point. And so I know, obviously, I mean, how much of it is the truth and how much of it is like Hollywood Bird, bullshit. Birdman. But like after Batman and all that, he kind of fell on harder times, being an aging like sort of action icon, sex symbol, or whatever, which happens. Um, so yeah, maybe he should have done it, but uh, I'm not the fan, man. I can't speak. You know, money isn't everything, especially if you're rich. And, That's like, true. Maybe he just wanted to move on to like more creatively stimulating projects, and I probably can't name anything he did. Jackie Brown. He did, but he was like, bro, he didn't even want to do that, though. You know that, right? He didn't. He did not want to do it. He felt very uncomfortable doing it, and Quentin talked him into it. And I think his performance is pretty good. But why I'm, didn't he want to do it? Uh, he did not think he was right for that role. Hmm. And he played. He actually played the, the role twice. What do you mean he played it twice? That so the year after, Steven Sodenberg made a movie called Out of Sight. Oh yeah, I've seen Out of Sight. Yeah, and he yeah. plays the same character. Yeah, I thought you. Um, I, I I don't know. I'm like, was he a second character in Jackie Brown or something? I'm like what no. the fuck? I don't, I don't remember that. Yeah, you know, he was surprised. He reprised the role in another film. Okay, yeah. Uh, that's not what I mean, though, you know, because he's like a supporting character in that. Oh, yeah. No, I'm trying to think of like movies he starred in. Yeah. Um, after this, I think he did uh, He did that Harold Ramis comedy, Multiplicity, which was bad. And oh. uh, he did Jack Frost. Yeah, he probably, maybe he should have done this. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. <laughs> and I'm also like, you know, like, yeah, the, the dialogue isn't as like Batman Returns but it's definitely a lot less corny than Batman 89. I, I don't agree with that. I think they're both the same. Uh, I would call the dialogue in this uh, bad. I would call the dialogue in 89 mediocre. So the I think there's shit. some good dialogue in here. I think there's a couple good quips, a co- couple good wood, one-liners and everything, but it just felt very I think mo- I think most of what Jim Carrey says is phenomenal. I don't think that's the writing. I think that's <laughs> Jim Carrey. <laughs> In fact, I think that the only direction that fucking Schumacher gave to carry through the entire actual production of the movie was when you strike that post, stick your ass out more. Because mm-hmm. he was very on the money with doing that. Other than yeah. that, I'm pretty sure he's freelancing. And yeah. I don't even, I can't even fully tell if he's trying or not. So this is the 100% the Batman movie that the world needed in 1995. It feels like it feels like because this was a big deal. This is a big, this is a big this was like the big summer movie that year, mm-hmm. and uh, it at the time people loved it, mm-hmm. and then retroactively hated it mm-hmm. because of the follow up to this, which we'll mm-hmm. get to next week. But um, I don't know. I I feel like it's 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 like one hell of a ride. If like uh, Joel Schumacher describes, it's like it's like um it's like a Saturday Night Fever on acid or something. Wasn't nearly enough assault. Yeah, I thought that was what was really missing. If you're gonna make the Saturday Night Fever comparison, um, or just compare it to the Burton movies, to be honest, yeah, uh, I don't know. It didn't have that like grit though of like a Saturday Night Fever, that like '70s like dirty New York thing. Mm-hmm. Where like that's was really important to ground your movies. Is I love the neon nightscape and like the I, I I'm, I'm tempted to call this like trash noir. And I mean that I love trash noir, like that neon and like gross, grimy, like Blade Runner sort of aesthetic. But you need that like you need to see like homeless people. You need to see like dirt in the fucking the set pieces and everything. It was like it was too clean for Mm. that. And like Saturday Night Fever is a perfect example of that where like, you know, and for, for somebody who hasn't seen Saturday Night Fever in a long time, it's in a lot of ways satire. It is satire. Um, where you see those master shots and everything of Travolta dancing and stuff. And yeah, it's all glammed up and everything, but it's not really about that. Everything else in the movie is fucking gross. 
mm-hmm. and grimy and it's a feels like a kind of grounded real like realistic depiction of a subculture in 70s new york city yeah i've always described it as it, it's mean streets with, with, with their dancers yeah and i kind of like it more than mean streets i do too i like the, the there are set pieces in mean streets that are brilliant and maybe you say people like people hating batman forever because of its predecessor which makes sense i think mean streets uh certainly not overrated because it's a masterpiece but because of Taxi Driver and then Goodfellas and, uh, you know, 25 other great movies yeah. he made, I think it's remembered so favorably because of that. Mm-hmm. Although it is, you know, I do love that movie. Yeah. But um, I think I would, I actually kind of think Saturday Night Fever is more impressive. Oh, also, yeah. Also, had a much higher budget, no yeah. doubt about that, than Mean Streets. But what Mean Streets is trying to say is, like, a lot simpler Mm-hmm. What the? F- why the fuck am I talking about Mean Streets? We're talking about Batman. All right, yeah. So nipples. What's up with that man? I get it. I get what, what George uh, Joel is trying to do. George is next week. Yeah. All right. Uh, Joel has described why he did that choice, and the costume designers talked about it. He basically was like, in comic books, when you read a comic book, everyone is so like perfect, and they're just like chiseled. They're like Roman statues and that's mm-hmm. why that was where the the nipples thing came from he wanted them to feel like they were chiseled greek gods he wanted it to feel like batman was hercules well that's yeah okay you should have gone all out then and just and just done like a, on the cod piece just like a tiny like roman penis i feel like he if he if he had the real creative control he would have done it. He would have too. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I, I wrote the note like towards the end of the movie when you get the standoff between Edward Nigma and Bruce Wayne, which is one of my favorite scenes, when uh, Nigma is hitting on um, Chase, and he hits on her, and then he's like challenging Bruce and backing him down about his new invention, how much money he's like going to be making or is making, and then he reaches his hand towards the camera and says, "Shall we dance?" And then you get the reverse shot, and he's actually talking to Chase. But for a moment, I thought he was asking Bruce to dance. And I'm like, if jo- if Joel had the real creative control, that would have been the move. Yeah. And that would have been hilarious. Yeah. And uh, I wish there was more of that. Yeah. There's still a lot of it, but I wish there was more of that bizarreness and bending the... Because I think the mid-90s were a good time to, have, to bring up that chiseled Greek god male fantasy, like testosterone-fueled thing about superheroes and athletes and yeah. <laughs> professional wrestlers. And... uh really challenge what exactly is going on in the male psyche and uh-huh. how fragile it is. And I think Joel, I think that's probably like the aspect of the movie that I really enjoyed. I think he is doing that a little bit and being really clever and like about it. And there's like a lot of great subtext and like just the way he frames the, the action between the two actors and everything. I loved that. I thought that was great. And I wish it was more of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to get out, go right off the bat. Do you wish Burton made this movie? Ah, uh, I I wish that it had a completely different script. So I don't. You can take you can take what you want from that. I think that uh, I love Batman Returns, and I guess I would have liked one more of Burton's because we never got it. And I also think maybe fifteen minutes into it, I would have been like, "All right, Tim, enough." Because isn't that my, isn't that mine and a lot of people's take on Tim Burton? And I grew up with Tim Burton. I love a lot of Tim Burton's movies. I return to them. I watch them a lot. Ed Wood is one of my all-time favorite films. I love Edward Scissorhands. I love Beetlejuice, but I watched it too much growing up. Love Nightmare Before Christmas. I know he only produced that, but a lot of that is the Burton aesthetic. Um, and then you hit a certain point, and it's like, Tim, enough. Because it's like, it's not that he's one note. He can do a lot of different things. But it's like, you move on. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because it's he relies so heavily on his aesthetics and also the way he directs his actors and everything has not necessarily formulaic, but it's the Burton thing. And it's like, all right, I got it. You know, with someone like Tarantino, his aesthetic, where a lot of people are like, yeah, dude, I get it. But like his was enough to grow into other things. So it's like more ser- now he does like more like long spaghetti western style uh like three hour long movies or at least that's what he's done the last decade so he's definitely grown as a filmmaker where i feel like burton didn't burton was a hell of like a young filmmaker and then just sort of trailed off 
And I think that if he had done a third Batman movie, that may have happened a little earlier because he probably would have gotten burnt out as soon as he hit production. Um, now, if you want to rephrase the question, ask me, am I glad that Joel Schumacher got to make a Batman movie? Absolutely. Yeah, me because too. Because in that way, I thought that this, I'm glad this, the worst criticism I can give of a movie is this should not exist. This is boring. This is derivative. You know, bad is subjective, and I like movies that are that I also think are bad. You know, my favorite one, which you give me all the shit about, is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Bad movie. I love it because I'm glad that it exists because it's wonderful. The vision of it is wonderful. And I love that Joel Schumacher was able to make this weird-ass fucking movie with all the money in the world. Why in the fuck did anyone let him make this movie? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. It's ludicrous. It's absolutely insane. It's like you take the Adam West thing, you bring it up to the 90s, that 60s sort of zaniness, and you see it in the sound effects, which is probably the best part of the fucking movie, is the sound effects are so comical. Um, and then you age it up into the 90s as like a reflection of the 60s, and you just we just pump it full of just fucking tens of millions of dollars, man. Just fucking $50 million. How much was this movie? Uh, 50, I'm guessing $50 million. $50 million, Is that your final answer? 30 to $50 million. I'm uh, going to go $35 they, million. They gave Joel Schumacher a check of $100 million. Are you fucking... T- oh, my... All right. Yeah, no, I guess that makes sense with the ending set pieces and stuff. There was a lot of action in that with the Batwing. For for comparison's sake, Tim Burton was given sixty five million on Batman Returns. What about eighty nine? Because eighty nine at times did feel a little cheap in a good way. Uh, eighty nine. Let me. Find I felt it. like it was great filmmakers up. covering up for a shitty budget. Thirty five to forty eight million. Oh wow, that's, and, that's uh, actually a and lot. good forty. Well, good forty five million to that went to Jack Nicholson. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> Yeah, minus the Prince royalty checks and the Jack Nicholson payment. Yeah, it was a good one million. <laughs> it was a Clockwork Orange, yeah. but Batman. Um, so this is a bizarre science experiment. I'm glad that it exists. Like oh, yeah. I said, the worst thing I can say about a movie is it shouldn't exist. No matter how, and it's a lot of Oscar movies. Is like this is incredibly well made, well constructed. You know, it's thought provoking. But I've seen it 120 times. I never saw a movie like this before. I've seen Adam West before. But to see it just pumped full of fucking money and shit. I think like, I don't. I don't think the Adam West comparison. I think it's. I think it's valid, but I also don't think it's 100 percent valid. I think that's where. I think that's where he was leaning in it. Joel was leaning more towards the Dick Spring comics of the 50s, mm-hmm. not the Adam West style. And that's where Batman and Robin happens, where he decides, all right, we're gonna go with the Adam West thing, mm-hmm. because as um, the producer, like executive producer of these films, Michael Uslan, he's also executive producer of every Batman movie ever made. He says that each Batman movie of that era represents a different comic mm-hmm. era. So Tim Burton's '89 is the 1930s original Bill Finger, Bob Kane thing. Batman Returns is that 70s fu- and like 80s fucked up Batman. Mm-hmm. The Batman Forever is the 19 late late 40s early 50s Dick mm-hmm. Spring like giant pencil fucking thing. And then the Batman and Robin is a full born the return of the Adam West. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um well when I say Adam West I think of the I think of 60s era cartoons mm. with the this this movie's a cartoon. And it's the sound effects. You know what I'm talking about. It's, there's a million cartoon yeah. sound effects. Yeah, and I actually with, think it's great. Like with the goon, blah, 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 that guy. Yeah. But it's also just little things that are built into the score. If you listen and stuff, a lot of like, like I, I don't know, what is it, like the slide whistle? Um, the, that's like another one, like in Jurassic Park, when Newman falls down the, the waterfall, they play a slide whistle like it's a 60s cartoon. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the slide whistle was in there a couple of times. Um, also, I guess this counts as like the score. But the theremin use, or at least the old school horror mad scientist thing they did with Jim Carrey's character, I thought that was great. Mm-hmm. And theremin is kind of like on the line between sound effect versus score. Yeah. I think they did it enough, I would call it just part of the score. But all that stuff just felt very like old timey and like quirky and all that shit and fun. Yeah. Um, one question, a couple questions before we get to the actual film film. Uh, I think the pre-production stuff is very interesting. Like, do you feel that we were robbed of a great Sam Raimi Batman movie, knowing what we know how he can make a great superhero movie later on? Uh, no. Really? I think I think Spider-Man is a a very different character than Batman, 
And I also don't really like Spider-Man that much, but I like his movie. Well, I like the first two movies. Um, I don't I don't know. I've seen most of Sam Raimi's films over the course of his whole career, and his strengths just lean into Spider-Man. And, you know, Toby Toby Maguire's got to... He doesn't know how to harness this power fully yet, and he's got to get in a cage match with Macho, Macho Man Randy Savage. Shit like that. That's Sam Raimi, man. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, I'm, I mean, Sam Raimi, especially in the 90s, was a great filmmaker. I'm sure his Batman movie would have been yeah. good, but I don't feel fucking particularly robbed about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think it probably would have had more in line with Burton, though, like visually. Yeah, I think, way, I think... I think that actually would have been worse to get a Tim Burton knockoff to do a third movie. Yeah. You know, that's the biggest problem with, uh, well, one of the many bit problems with like Jurassic Park 3 is you do two Spielberg movies, then you go Joe Johnson, who's doing a Spielberg sort of thing. You mean Where, Paul Thomas Anderson? Whoever made Jurassic Park <laughs> three really, we'll start a new podcast where we uncover movie secrets. You know, the the obvious one is uh, Steven Spielberg contractually was not allowed to direct uh, Pol- Poltergeist, um, so he had Toby Hooper do it. But I I love both those directors, and uh, that movie is ninety yeah. percent Steven Spielberg directed. Yeah. Um. Uh. You know, another one obviously is did Paul Thomas Anderson actually direct Jurassic Park three? The answer is yes. But we'll get into that on a different show. My point is, is you go to Spielberg movies, even if the second one is one of the worst fucking movies ever made, and then you go to a decent Joe Johnson movie, it just feels weird. Yeah. Whereas it would have been better if it had gone Spielberg, Johnson, and then somebody else. Um, if you go Burton, Burton, and then, you know, whoever the, his equivalent of a Chris Columbus, whoever his Henry Chris Columbus. That's true. I mean, I thought one of the all-time great animation directors. Oh yeah, but yeah, but I've I've seen Monkey Bone. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, you go Burton, Burton, Henry Selleck, and 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 then especially if Burton is just the executive producer and not the producer producer, then you have problems Mm -hmm. because you just notice it. Yeah, I also am fascinated by the idea of a John McTiernan. Uh, Batman film because he because like I said that like one, uh, Die Hard that three guy, there is a lot of similarities because yeah. Jimmy Jer- Jeremy Irons is throwing out riddles the entire movie. I mean you don't want to get into this right now. You don't. I could talk for three hours about the genius of Predator. As well, one, well, one, I'm not talking about Predator. That I'm, is I'm, no no no, but that is one of the gr- best directed movies of all time. That movie's genius. Mm-hmm. All right, that movie is fucking brilliant. Yeah, John McTiernan. I, I I love John McTiernan. Like yeah. I said I love I, uh, Die Hard is one of my. Favorite fucking movies. Hashtag free McTiernan. He is free. He's I know. He's planning on making a new movie. I know. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. Did you watch Hunt for Red October? I have. It's fucking great, right? Yeah. Probably one of Sean Be- Connery's best performances. Yeah. Um. So Val Kilmer. So Keaton left, and it was because of that, Rene Russo was fired because of the fact that uh, Michael Keaton, uh, they wanted to cast a younger actor, and they wouldn't believe that any person that wasn't Michael Keaton would be attracted to Rene, Rene Russo, which is horrible because Rene Russo is a very beautiful woman, a very talented actress. It was the nineties. I know. It's yeah. just it's just such a it's just such a scummy yeah. thing. I mean right? he, yeah, but if you want to get into it, maybe write a uh, a female lead that's not um literally there to be the love interest of the main character. Yeah. Which again, that's what I like about Schumacher is that he plays with it a little bit. Yeah, which we'll get to in a bit. Uh, do you know some of the people who were originally in the running to play Batman? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't particularly remember. Uh, shit. Was one of them Pierce Brosnan? No, that was in 89. By this point, by this point, Pierce was now Bond. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, that's what would have been funny. Because you notice that shot, right, when he's doing the detective shit, where he's wearing the turtleneck. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Evoking the image, but, you know objectively not as good of a looking man as Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan's one of the best looking men of all time. I know. I said what I said. Uh, yeah, and he's also buddies with Burton, so that makes sense for 89. Yeah. Was one of them... Um, oh, what's his fucking name? I know, I just lost it. I, I had it and I lost it. I got some big names coming at you. Yeah. Uh, the first one who was offered was Ethan Hawke, yeah, which I is a very that, yeah. strange... A strange decision. Ethan Hawke is one of those Hollywood actors that is considered for literally every single role ever. I feel like I've read him considered for like Joker roles and stuff as well. Yeah. I love Ethan Hawke. I think Ethan Hawke is a fucking great actor. But uh, B- Batman in 1995, I don't see it. I don't see it at all, actually. 
Mm-hmm. Like I don't see the before sunrise Ethan Hawke being in this movie. Or maybe as Robin, but as Batman, coming off of Batman Returns, like when we have like a graying haired Batman, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't see how that could could that really happen. Uh, another big one was uh, Keanu Reeves. Mm-hmm. No, Bo- both Alec and William Baldwin. Alec Baldwin, that was it. Yeah, I can see it because of the chin. Yeah. I don't like it, but I can see it. Tom Hanks. Uh, Kurt Russell. Of course. Uh, Rafe Fiennes. Interesting. Johnny Depp. Of course. And you ready for this one? Mm-hmm. Daniel Day-Lewis. All right. If I could just be in one meeting between a director and, a, and an actor, it would be the Daniel oh, Day-Lewis-Joel sure. Schumacher meeting of... I want you to play Batman with bat nipples. <laughs> and then turn around and show your butt. Yeah. And does Daniel Day-Lewis, like, I want to know what the preparation he would have went through to do this. <laughs> uh, all I know is that crime in Chicago and New York and L.A. would have decreased drastically <laughs> in two years and then would have gone back to at, like at a staggering rate as soon as the film was done. It's funny because this wasn't the only time he'd be considered for it because mm. he was also slightly considered in 89 mm-hmm. and he would also be considered in 2005. Mm-hmm. I knew about the 2005 one. Jesus Christ, imagine him and Heath Ledger. Oh god. Yeah. Yeah. I I imagine he would have done the same voice in Dark Knight, but he would have made it work so much better and I don't know how. It's because he would have made it would have, he would have done something with his body that he does. Yeah, I don't know. Man's man's insane. Yeah, um, not that Christian Bale isn't a great actor, but he ain't no DDL. Oh yeah, nobody is. Yeah, it's literally nobody. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, not even Daniel Day Lewis because he doesn't know who he is. Yeah. Um. Let's go, and, and then obviously we went, they went with Val Kilmer, who I think was a phenomenal choice. I think Val Kilmer is every bit as good as Michael Keaton, if not better in certain aspects mm, such as his physical appearance well yeah his physical appearance of course but i think that it's important i think that kilmer plays more of the damaged guy more mm. a guy who has one uh who's already traumatized by the death of his parents but also a man who's committed atrocities mm-hmm. like that's like that's a man who's haunted by the fact that he strapped a bomb to somebody and threw him down a well i, I got that guy deserved it I know, but he's haunted by yeah. it. Yeah, no, I got, I got you. I think, I think that, I think Kilmer plays that really well, and I think while you know he also he, he also can plays the Keaton horniness, but like more subdued, less like aggressively horny, less like I'm gonna rape you horny, more like less rapey, but in a way, I, you know, it, it kind of had a charm to it in mm. of itself. I don't uh, think it had a charm in it in '89. I think it had more of a charm in it in, in Returns when he mm. wasn't as rapey. Yeah, he's also going to like. He was also interested in a woman who could beat the shit out of him. Yeah. Uh, I think I don't know. I think I think Val knocked it out of the park, and I kind of wish he played Batman more. Mm. I think that I think that if Val wasn't can- George considered for this one too. No, I thought he was considered. Clooney before. wasn't like relevant yet. Well, he was he was big on like TV and shit. Yeah, but that's TV. Yeah, he hadn't done From Dust Till Dawn yet. That's true. That was uh, the, 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 the yeah they were shooting that when this came out. Yeah. So like, he was about to blow up, mm-hmm. but he wasn't there yet. He wasn't yet George Clooney. Did Dust Till Dawn really blow him up? I don't know. I always assumed that was just a movie made for me. I don't know. I can't imagine that being a huge hit. Did you see, see the actor he's working across? Well, he was on ER. I, know. I think I think also the other fact that with, like, get with him getting Batman, I don't think he was like that big yet. Mm-hmm. I think he was like big, but not like super big. Because it was more of like, you have Arnold, you don't need a big Batman. True. It's like Keaton. You know, Keaton wasn't that big. Wait, what year did Nicholson Batman and Robin was? come out? Was it a 98? 97. 97. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because I thought he won Sexiest Man in the World in 97. Well, there you go. Yeah. It happened in weird, 97. Fucking, yeah. Um, yeah, no, he wasn't considered for this one um, at all. But I... I, I what did you think of Kilmer's performance? Because I, like I said, I, I love, I love, I love everything that he does, and I, I kind of like think that in some aspects he's better than Keaton. Uh, yeah, I think that what he's going for works really well, and I, and I like that. Um, I think that a lot of his dialogue just sort of fails him, and uh, maybe because of that, I feel like his range comes off as limited in the more emotional scenes. 
I don't fully I don't fully buy it, but mm-hmm. I sort of buy it in a way that like say I'm a huge Kurt Russell guy just because of the cult movies he's done over the years from you know, Escape from New York to uh like Bone Tomahawk and all that shit. And so I love Kurt Russell. I think Val Kilmer did it probably better than Kurt Russell objectively could do it. So I'm not gonna knock him at yeah. all. Um like you say about the horniness thing, I mean I hate that scene when they're when he when a chase like confronts him on the roof and is like her cleavage is hanging out and he's like so distracted it's so like eye rolling and shit Mm -hmm. you know but again it's probably the way that he's directed to do it because i know joel is setting up to do his own thing with it um but i just felt like that scene was just awful compared to particularly the movie you know batman returns where that dynamic is really good especially as far as like superhero love interest films can go but even like 89 and they did feel like two real people getting to know each other Mm -hmm. where that just felt very fucking hollywood movie fake bullshit yeah in a lot of ways this movie felt like like the star wars prequels if those were like fun and like competently made yeah the dialogue like all my criticism of it is it's too clean the Everything, the cinematography, everything about it is great except for the camera work. I feel like it just sucks. And the fucking, uh, did I say the dialogue? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The dialogue is a big fucking thing. Uh, just not totally relatable with like the characters and stuff. But I feel like it's a lot of fun set pieces and everything. Yeah. It just lacks that sort of grit and realism that you need to if you're going to go in that crazy fantasy neon world. You know, at least post seventies like films and stuff, you need to like contrast it. Yeah. And like I said, I think Joel did, but the way it was recut. Well, no, least... I mean I can just literally point that out in just the set design. Yeah. It's, it's just it just looks cheap. Hmm. In the way that like Attack of the Clones was made for two hundred million dollars and it looks cheap. Yeah. You know. Uh there's no love in there. But yeah, no, I, I, like I said, I can't praise Val Kilmer enough. Um, I just think like, he's also a very underrated actor mm-hmm. because of, like, I guess, how difficult he was to work with. I remember hearing someone compare say about, about Val Kilmer that he's the Tom Cruise who doesn't give a shit, which I think is a very accurate description of Val Kilmer. I can kind of see that. They, Yeah, I mean, they look alike. Val Kilmer's taller, which I appreciate. Tom Cruise supposedly, uh, as long as you wear a mask within six feet of him, very easy to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, not like the biggest Tom Cruise fan, I'll admit. He's a very talented actor. I love him in Tropic Thunder. I love him in Magnolia. Well, yeah, that's also, but that's that's a little different because, like, the, you know, the filmmaker. Yeah. Um, and I like him in Rain Man. Um, I hate him as Lestat. Absolutely, fucking nails on chalkboard. What movie? Vampire. Or we're not Vampire Lestat. Interview with a Vampire where yeah. he plays Lestat. Hmm. I haven't seen that. It's <sighs> fucking... It's it's one of those movies that's really well made and it just feels very like dry in Hollywood. Hmm. And uh, there's supposed to be a lot of sexual tension between Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise and it boils down to um, they're both handsome men. Well, wasn't it wasn't Tom Cruise a last minute replacement? I don't think so. Because wasn't it supposed to be River Phoenix? Oof. And then he died. I mean, then... that would have been a lot better. I mean, regardless, like, just the way he, like, I've, I've actually read the second book because I took a fantasy literature class in college. Mm-hmm. So I read the, the follow-up is a vampire Lestat. So it follows that character in, I think, 18th century France becoming a vampire and like learning how to be a vampire and all that shit. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, it's just his creative choices and stuff were just all wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, um but yeah, if if you have if you're not convinced that Val Kilmer is a really good actor, uh, I would recommend watching The Doors, or you know The Doors is a great Morrison. movie. Yeah, but his Morrison is phenomenal. He's the best part of the whole movie, and uh, Tombstone. Tombstone's a really good movie. And Heat. Yeah, Heat is also a really good movie. Also, uh, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Mm-hmm. That's how it's called, right? With the one with mm-hmm. Ju- Junior. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very. It's a like great, great actor. Yeah. Very underrated. Uh we also have Nicole Kidman in this one, uh, who was not the who was not obviously not the original choice. Rene Russo was. Other people who were considered were Sandra Bullock, Robin Wright, and Linda Hamilton. Linda Hamilton would have been an interesting choice, mm-hmm. and I think would have played it a lot differently. Yeah, less of a damsel, more of like a try to make it more of a badass thing. Yeah, 
What was what did I just watch with Robin Wright? Something. Forrest Gump? I don't know. You watch Forrest Gump a lot, so No I don't. You watch it like once a year. No I don't. Don't you don't you? No. Last oh. time I watched Forrest Gump, I was at a party in college five or six years ago. We were all like stoned and wasted and uh some guys like sat around the TV and it was like Forrest Gump is on and there's a party happening, but we kept being like Yo, is that Forrest Gump? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. Life is, you know, box of chocolates. Yeah, I'll see you later, man. And just as it went on, I, like, I got sucked in at some point. And then I sit down, and I'm like, oh, man, this is fucking, this is really affecting me. And then 30 minutes later, the party is done, and it's just a crowd of people just around this TV. Everyone's fucking high as fuck. Just like, who's ordering food? Like, I ain't moving. This movie is fucking good. Mm-hmm. Now, it's not... It is and it isn't. It's really, really fucking emotional if you're high. I think it's a really well made movie. It's extremely well made. It's just made. that the script has issues. It's extremely well made. It's uh but it's also um extremely well made, extremely well produced, extremely well acted. Um it's also really extremely fucking dumb. Mm-hmm. Like that's literally that's what it is. You know? But isn't that also the point? Is that Yeah. 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 And it's also the cynical part of my brain understands propaganda, and I understand that I'm watching propaganda, yeah. watching pro-America propaganda. Yeah. You know. But back to the film. Uh, Nicole Kidman obviously got casted, and she does what she can. She does what she can. And Nicole Kidman's a new, another amazing actress. Mm-hmm. Does some wonderful shit. But, uh, She's a very good actor. Uh, she kept the character from being embarrassing. Yeah. And that's probably the highest praise I can give. Uh, to continue the prequel comparison, Natalie Portman's character is embarrassing. And Natalie Portman, I love as an actor. I just, I like seeing her in things because I like her. Uh, but her character is embarrassing. Mm. Nicole Kidman's character in this is not embarrassing, but she should be. So I'm going to go, I'm going to do some running through some other casting choices from other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Two Face was never offered to Billy D. Williams. They bought him out of his contract. Uh, yep. Uh, that was when Burton left. He yeah. was gone. Tommy Lee Jones obviously is the is the uh, is the two face, and we'll, we'll, we're going to have a long talk about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other people who were offered the role were Al Pacino, <laughs> which would have been fucking incredible. Yeah, but you wouldn't have done that. You speak for yourself. You ever seen? Dick, you haven't seen Dick Tracy yet. Dick Tracy is like objectively an amazing movie. This fucking Pacino would have read the script and been like, "This fucking character is awful." Yeah, uh, Clint Eastwood. See what I just said, <laughs> you know, but like, not as good of an actor, but also a great actor. But same exact. Well, thing uh, as apparently, just Tommy Lee also went big to try to compete with Jim Carrey. Yeah, I know. On paper, apparently, oh, I know. It was a lot. It was actually want more. Yeah, I but I heard the lines that he said, and I saw the situations he was written into. No, I'm term I'm term, in terms of like Tommy was like, give me more. I want to. If I'm dealing with this guy, I gotta I, have more. I understand that. Yeah, that's fucking yeah. Um, Martin Sheen. Okay. Willem Dafoe. All right, now that now there's a man who maybe could have pulled it off. Nicholas Cage. Now there's a man who uh would have been worse than Tommy Lee Jones. And, and I like Nicholas Cage, but he would have been worse. Robert De Niro. Can you imagine? Robert De Niro and Jim and standing next to Jim Carrey in a leotard. Yeah, I can. Amazing. Jim Carrey would look at him, look him in the eyes, and be like, "See, pal, you want to fuck?" <laughs> Jim Carrey would be like, or uh, De Niro would be like, oh, "Sure." And then three minutes and fifteen seconds later, oh, yeah, you done? Oh, yeah. And oh, then, but then he blows him away at the end because he's annoying him. Another one was where'd you park? Two phase. Where'd you park, Harvey? <laughs> Oh, I know where I park. I parked over here. Did you? Did you? Mel Gibson well, all right, then. was also offered the part. Mel Gibson's a good actor. Mm-hmm. But he mm-hmm. turned it down because he was doing Braveheart. Probably the good move on his part. Yep. Uh, before we talk about Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face, what do you want to talk about now before we go into the Riddler casting? We can go into the Riddler thing. All right, so Riddler, just so we can get all the casting out of the way, uh, is, is Jim Carrey. The people who were offered was Robin Williams. He yep. turned it down because he was doing Jumanji. Yep. Uh, Michael Jackson lobbied hard for the part. Mm-hmm. Turned they turned him down. Yep. Uh, Would have done the same thing. Uh, they also offered it to John Malkovich, mm-hmm. Brad Dorff, uh, Kelsey Grammer, Matthew Broderick. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, thank God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank God, uh, man. Yeah, uh, Imagine that. Yeah. Uh, uh, riddle, riddle, me, riddle me this, guys. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he oh. bought my riddle. Oh, jeez. I think that's the guy in dressed in a bat suit. What are we going to do, guys? Um, he That man has no emotion at all. Yeah. It's, inc- it's, cr- it's crazy. Um, hey, man, if you fucking had to star in Godzilla 98, you would also have no emotion. True. Uh, Phil Hartman. Oh, God, why'd you have to do that to me? Steve Martin. Adam Sandler. And Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill would have been obviously very well good. I can also see Steve Martin working. I can also definitely see Phil Hartman working. Kelsey Grammer is an interesting choice. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that one. Uh, oh, and Rob Schneider, which uh, is the bottom of the barrel choice. As he is with everything. Yeah. He's the bottom of the barrel thing when Adam Sandler needs a stupid character. Mm-hmm. So what, what that one just... It is what it is. Yeah, when 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 Adam Sandler needs an ethnic character, he goes to Rob Schneider. Yeah. Rob, you're objectively white. Yeah. Why'd you say objectively like that? I need you to play a Guatemalan. Mm. What do I do? You say in a Guatemalan accent, you can do it. Mm. Mm. What do Guala- How do Guatemalans talk? Uh, this is the same as your Mexican accent. How much are you gonna pay me? Eight million dollars. Do I get to go on a cruise with you? Yeah, but you're going to be a few floors below my family. I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Now, here's a good que- question. Uh, do you th- Would you have preferred any of those other actors to Jim Carrey, or do you think Jim Carrey is perfect? Uh, for this role, Jim Carrey is perfect. Obviously, if I could uh, change the past, I'd want Phil Hartman to be in everything. That's mm-hmm. all I'm going to say about that. Yeah. Now, the last casting one we have to talk about is uh, Robin. Uh, mm-hmm. It the the main two it came down to two people it was uh, Chris O'Donnell and Leonardo DiCaprio mm-hmm. and well they clearly made the right choice yeah uh they they went to apparently it was a famous story that they went to Comic Con and showed pictures of both Chris O'Donnell and Leonardo DiCaprio to kids and they said who would win in a fight and they picked Chris O'Donnell because the man has muscle mass <laughs> I'm just picturing like a small child version of Mac from Always Sunny in Philadelphia yeah bro that other dude he fucking he kick his ass man. Yeah. There's also other things saying that Leonardo DiCaprio turned it down because he had a meeting with Joel Schumacher and it didn't go very well. <laughs> uh, other people who were considered and they met it was with... just funny because you know before Titanic, Leonardo DiCaprio had a meeting with James Cameron and the idea that that meeting didn't go as bad as his meeting with Joel Schumacher is hilarious. Yeah. Other people who were considered were Matt Damon, mm-hmm. Corey Feldman, mm-hmm. Mark Wahlberg, Move on. Uh, Ewan McGregor, oh. Jude Law, Alan Cummings, Christian Bale, and um, uh, Toby Stevens. Okay. Ewan McGregor would have been a good option. Yeah. I can see it. He's a, he's like the only one from the prequels who escapes with his dignity fully mm-hmm. intact. It would have been it would have been fun to see Christian Bale as Robin. Yeah, but then he probably wouldn't have been Batman. True. That, oh, no, he 100% wouldn't have been Batman because they wanted to distance themselves from Batman and Robin as much as possible. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is known as now the uh, the, the career decision that uh, destroyed Chris O'Donnell's A-lister status. Mm-hmm. Uh, the man was hot off of uh, Scent of a Woman with Al Pacino mm-hmm. and other, you know, early 90s shit. And uh, he could have been in Titanic, but he had to do Batman and Robin. Wah, wah. Hey man, life is like a box of chocolates. You don't even, you don't know what you're gonna get, yeah. man. So that's our cast. Very good casting for 1995, if you ask me. Outside of Tommy Lee Jones, uh, I'm not saying that Tommy Lee Jones is a bad actor. I love him in most things, but here he's just uh, he should not be, and he's not. No, <laughs> no. Uh, do you agree, or do you think that this is uh, something? I think everything about that character is awful. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. It is uh I think the opening is great. That one moment where we have like a taste of like, oh, maybe we might get an actually good Harvey Dent two face thing where he's like being quiet. It's just to me it's just wrong. Like I said before, you can play it in any way that you want, but he literally comes out playing it like the Joker. Not in the beginning, I'm talking about the first scene that he's in where he's like whispering talking and they only you only see the Harvey side. But then as soon as you see the scarred side, that's where he becomes like Yeah, but that's the same scene. 
No, I'm saying like I'm, I'm saying like you see you see. So the you think he's really good for the first fifteen seconds? He's on camera. The first like minute and a half, yes. All right. Well, I mean, I didn't count it, but uh, okay. I mean, by the end of the first scene, I'm like, this is awful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't. I can't. Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing he could do. Well, I mean, yeah, there's actually a lot that he could have done as an actor. He could have uh, not played it like Jim Carrey. Mm-hmm. Like, Jesus fucking Christ, how fucking. This is one of the stupidest things I have ever seen. Yeah. You got this. You got Jim Carrey playing Jim Carrey, playing Ace Ventura in a, in a you know, crazy sort of arch villain role. Uh, so let's get Tommy Lee Jones to fucking play it exactly the same. What the fuck? Well, like I said, I don't think it was Joel's intention. I think it was his job. Tommy Lee felt like he needed to compete with Jim to get the the notoriety of the screen time. It's moronic. Yeah, it's a bad decision. Yeah, and that's why I'm like the only person of that cast list, other than like maybe Defoe, who really could have competed, was Al Pacino. Because mm-hmm. if Jim Carrey gets out, there's one man who can get louder, and his name's Al fucking Pacino. He could get louder, but again, the 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 shit he's saying, like, maybe Pacino could make it sing. Because Carrie could, but, like, Al Pacino's too good for that. True. Um, I, would, I would just love to fucking see Al Pacino yelling at a rubber suit Val Kilmer being mm-hmm. like, Why can't you just die? Just die! You know, yeah. Like, he's repeating, doing the repeating himself shit. Yeah. I love it. Because he keeps forgetting his lines, mm-hmm. yeah. But, yeah. Uh... The basic plot of the film is Batman. Uh, what is the plot of this fucking movie? <laughs> oh, he doesn't like women anymore. And he doesn't want to be Batman. Okay. Also, you have Jim Carrey, who's a. Uh, all right, yeah, let's just show you all Jim Carrey's poems. Jim Carrey plays Edward Nigma, who is a Wayne Tech um, employee who is obsessed with uh, Bruce Wayne. And I think Jim Carrey has the most interesting character arc and most interesting character motivations throughout the film because mm-hmm. the movie is starring Jim Carrey. Mm-hmm. And um, I love the fact that he's so obsessed with this man that uh, he's blinded by his own weirdness mm-hmm. and his own fucking creepiness. Mm-hmm. And then later on when it becomes a success, he really models himself after this man and then it's almost like he starts losing his mind once he starts realizing that that man isn't real. It's like a fucking mm-hmm. facade. Mm-hmm. I think that's fascinating. Yeah, I think in a way like that could have been handled better. Oh, of course it could have been. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm making deal. chicken shit out of chicken salad, yeah. but. Well, I mean, reverse I, I, order. You, you opened it by saying it was fucking it was an incredible movie. I know. I think it's incredible. Is it? Was it? Well, is it like a thought provoking Dark Knight thing that I'm ma- that I'm making it seem to be? But that character description, absolutely not. It's not. Yeah. But it's not the uh, best. But well, like what you just described could have been. Yeah, I know. It's probably not in the '90s. Thematically, there's a lot going on here that's incredible. That mm-hmm. could have been. That could have. That's like it's like the first step towards a Nolan style Batman. It's just that it's done in the complete opposite direction. Yeah. And I, mean, I think it's phenomenal for that. Because... What his character ultimately boils down to being is, uh, Jim, you know your lines? Yeah, for the most part. All right, uh, we're going to hold on a medium shot. We're going to swing the camera back and forth in between Dutch angles and uh, go. Mm-hmm. That's what every single move is. Every single thing. Feel- it's like a cartoon. Everything feels like a set piece. He's going fucking crazy. He's cranked up to 16. It's like Joel told him that Ace Ventura wasn't enough. And we need to like really let him out. Mm-hmm. Like, what? Who, who? What are you holding back when you did Ace Ventura? What, what, whatever is pent up inside you that you're not letting out, let's let that out. Yeah. Okay. Give me uh, some goddamn Cuba beat. <laughs> I hope he actually fucking said that to him. Yeah. He'd be like, "Oh, you want more than that?" Um. Yeah. And it's fascinating to watch. He carries every scene he's in. Is it objectively good? No. I actually don't really know what's going on half the time that he's performing. I also don't care. It's fascinating to watch. It's also. Just knowing Jim Carrey and knowing about him and like his career, like wh- where it goes and everything, I I also am watching this kind of bored in like a does he hate what he's doing right now? And I'm like I swear to God he looks dead behind the eyes. He nails every one of his marks and every line, and he does so many little things that I know he came up with on his own. I know he worked his ass off in this character, but I feel like he hates what he's doing. Mm. But maybe that's just me because I know about the man behind yeah. the character but uh i feel like you can see it in certain moments maybe but i think that also plays within into the character because like it's the man himself edward nigma is a soulless man i think that kind of 
feeds into that performance. Mm-hmm. His own, I think that Jim Carrey may have seen himself a little bit in some of his, mm-hmm. some of the, the parts of that character. And also, I know that a lot of people probably point out that you know Jim Carrey probably harnesses a lot of the the fan interactions he has on Edward Nygma's first mm-hmm. appearances. I can see that. Yeah, and I I think that the some of the best acting that he does in the film is when is in that first scene that he's in. I agree. When he's like when he's so enraptured with him, and then that that heartbreaking moment for well, at least he's playing it heartbreaking when Bruce turns him down. He's like, "You were supposed to understand," and yeah. then his face completely changes within seconds. Being, I will make you understand. Mm-hmm. Like that. That no, that's like. That is like some actually like really great Jim Carrey like mm-hmm. like trying to he's like you know you know that's where Jim Carrey does that thing where even his like most high comedies he's doing he also tries to do a little bit of dramatic to show like hey I want to do Internal Sunshine one day mm-hmm. yeah uh, that's probably my favorite scene with him my second favorite scene would be when he first recruits or sort of takes control of Two Face. Because mm-hmm. of those subtle moments and everything, because he's p- sort of playing with like statuses and stuff, where he comes in basically being like, "I'm in charge now," but he is in Two Face's, you know, lair or something, and he sort of plays down to Two Face as if Two Face has a say, and he's sort of mocking him, and he's doing all this like very simply and everything, and I, I really enjoy that while still being over the top. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I, Jim Carrey seals the show, uh, and I, you can tell that also Joel sees that and plays into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was also the biggest star on the cast at the time. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, apparently shooting this film was a disaster. Oh, I'm sure that it because, was. Because uh, according, uh, Schumacher had incredible problems with... Uh, well, obviously, the, you have the rivalry on set between Tommy Lee and Rid- and Jim Carrey, who are in every scene together. Mm-hmm. Um, you also had Schumacher uh, <laughs> not getting along with Tommy Lee. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, Schumacher did not get along with Val Kilmer mm-hmm. at all. All these things could have been predicted mm-hmm. very early on. Apparently everybody else was fine. Yeah, but those. Tommy but those Lee, are also the the three people that are sort of known to be like difficult to work with with a smaller time not not, not like a first time director but a smaller name director. Mm-hmm. Like it's just kind of common sense. Smaller name director with such like an out there sort of vision for what he's going for. Yeah, like, it's just you know hello. It is unfortunate that yeah. he. Uh, and it's not like as a producer, Tim Burton is the sort of guy who's going to like fucking challenge these actors and sort of break them down. Tim Burton was not on set yeah. at all. Yeah, that's what I imagine. <laughs> like Tim Burton, they asked him about it. Oh, yeah, I, I, my name's on it. Oh, yeah. yeah, bet. Yeah, yeah, my name's on there, For I guess. For sure, man. Uh, also, sure. fun trivia fact. Uh, in the scene when Jim Carrey first meets Bruce Wayne, one of Bruce's assistants is played by a young John Favreau. Okay. You know John F- yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very I I I just noticed that for the first time. Oh, okay. Like, is that fucking John Favreau? Uh Things I hate about this movie cuz there's a lot I can I I love, but things I hate about this movie is uh the Batmobile sucks. In a way, I can that's another thing where I'm thinking of like the Adam West thing where the wings on the back are like clearly like cheap rubber and look like they're gonna fall off constantly yeah and it's just like i just love that so much i hate it yeah i wish it was the burton bat mobile because it would have made sense since they destroy it later anyway yeah but you know whatever uh it would have made sense in this movie that the batmobile looks like a penis uh, just thematically would have fit mm. makes sense why robin would have stolen it yeah i also am not a big fan of the theme the dun 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 yeah, dun, yeah. dun Some of the score is really annoying, and yeah. then some of it is is fucking great. Yeah, I just don't think it lives up to the Danny Elfman scoring. I'm just picturing the fucking the poor guy who had to score this theme and everything. He's just browbeaten and shit. He's just like fucking. Well, what the fuck do you want from me, man? <laughs> fucking, fucking Danny, fucking. Yeah, I'll just give you Danny fucking Elfman. Go get Danny fucking Elfman. Fuck off, you fucker. They should have. They should have got Danny fucking Elfman. Probably wouldn't have done it. I think he would have. After Bur- after Burton didn't want to direct him it. Him and him and Burton were on the outs. At so the time, probably, yeah. yeah. 
All right. I don't, I don't fucking know. Because they had uh, disagreements about... Um, like who gets to date Johnny Depp? About Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay. And then uh, that's why uh, Delphin doesn't do the score for um, Ed Wood. And I think Mars... I don't know if he does the score for Mars Attacks either. Yeah, I believe he does. Interesting. I don't... Yeah. Hmm. I think so. Yeah, look that up. Jamie, pull that shit up. Um... Type in Gorilla Eats Baby. Yeah. I also am not a big fan of uh, Chase calling Bruce on the bat uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the bat signal and then just showing up with lingerie. She also shows up to the crime scene in lingerie in the beginning of the film. She has yeah. lingerie on. I hate everything about both those scenes. Yeah. Uh, also, I don't like that they reordered. Joel's uh, initial idea. The original way the film was going to open was that uh, Doctor Burton was going to be going through the yeah ha, 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 was going to be uh, going through the halls of Arkham Asylum to go visit Two Face, and he was going to be sitting there in like a silhouette. And then they were going to open it, and it wasn't Two Face. And then they were going to look up, and someone was hanging there. And that was going to be where you had the thing. And then it was going to cut to Bruce in the meeting Jim Carrey. Him going into the thing, getting suited up, driving to the thing. Then we have our first action sequence. Mm. He did do Mars Attacks, but Mars Attacks came out a year after this. Mm, okay. Um. So I just think the, the, like the order of events there works better mm-hmm. rather than like we open the movie. I'll well, you know I'll get drive through. Fucking going into fucking a big set action set piece. That all looked like it was shot way after production. And it was uh, not good. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it. Like, like I said, the original Schumacher way of opening it seems like a more fluid. Yeah, I can put it like I'll put it like this because I know on Batman Returns you were like, "Oh, this is the best way to introduce Batman fucking ever." Oh my god, where it's like he's waiting for the thing, and then the signal happens, silhouetted behind it, blah blah blah. Uh, uh this is definitely the worst. I could tell <laughs> immediately. Uh, and I don't even think that's arguable. I could tell immediately that this there was something wrong with this movie. As soon as just by the opening, in that again with the prequel comparisons, you know how um, Phantom Menace opens just at that flat angle, mm-hmm. and they and they get off the ship and they're in like robes, and then they uh, sit down and they're like, oh, we're, so there's a meeting coming in, and uh, we're gonna talk about some things and everything. This isn't that bad. That's one of the worst ways to open an adventure movie ever. But uh, again, uh, Batman just just walks in a frame, and then uh, I'll get takeout, and then it's like that awkward cut from his like powerful silhouette to the the reverse shot which is exact framing of alfred but it's so fucking awkward it looks like a student film shot it or mm-hmm. like a yeah like a film student shot it and it's just and then they're just like sweeping camera like close up on him and everything and i'm like this is fucked you know whether you like like tim burton style or not like that whole sequence with um uh, you know, it's like Christmas time and, and they're getting rid of the baby and throwing him in a in a river, which, like, while well, we pointed out is illogical and a horrible way to kill a baby, it's cinematic as fuck and it sucks you into the world. Mm-hmm. That's what a movie needs to do. Yeah. Uh, you should learn, like, a lot from a movie with the opening frame. Yeah. Which I guess with this, they're cheating because the opening frame, obviously, is the Bat logo with, for, you know, forever coming over it. But nonetheless, like, you need to put more thought into it. Which I think... I feel like a film professor now. But, like, like, I'm, creating but, like, a but like, I'm saying... Joel did do that. I'm not Joel's criticizing defense. Joel for doing that. Like, because yeah. what you're saying sounds like a movie. Yeah. You know, I'm saying the opening of this isn't a movie. Mm-hmm. The opening of this is a TV show. Yeah. It's a cartoon. Yeah. He walks in a frame. Yeah. It's like, was there a time limit or something? Are we like short on time? Like, what's I going on? I think that, here? well, obviously, the the whole thing is that they told Joel lighten it up, and the way he opens his movie is they're in a dark, dingy mental asylum, and there's a man hanging. Mm hmm from a noose in a fucking cell that two face is supposed to be in. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's not the way that <laughs> the studio is going to want you to open your movie. And then they can't just cut that part out. They can't just go right to mm-hmm. the Bruce being at Wayne tech. Mm-hmm. So they have to fucking just go right to him being Batman. Cause like I said, like it, it, it makes it more, it would make sense. Like, you know, you go from that, that murder moment and then you go into the him Wayne Tech he knows the signal goes in goes to the thing so then it's actually like a thing where it's like oh Batman is needed mm-hmm. not oh I see the I'm thing I'm getting takeout yeah it's not it's not it's also like 
I think that the way they use the, that scene later on when he actually goes to the goes to the um what he sees when he sees that Wayne Tech and then he goes and then it says her in lingerie it doesn't make any sense mm-hmm. or or it undercuts what we had already seen earlier in the film. Mm-hmm. I think that whole that that like the like the whole rooftop thing other than the Catwoman references is, is like garbage. Oh, it's garbage. Yeah. Yeah. And and also their opening scene where they meet. Mm-hmm. Just fucking just flies over the police line and shit. I like I get it. Again, when I'm thinking of Adam West where it's just like not necessarily Adam West, but it's oh Batman's the hero, he's here to help and stuff. But well, it's we've like, already established that in the last movie. I know, but it's dumb. It's a dumb visual where mm-hmm. he just flies over a closed police thing, lands down and immediately starts hitting on a blonde. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I get what he's going for, but it's dumb. Mm-hmm. It's really dumb. And again, for kids in the nineties, yeah, who cares? It's dope as fuck. But I'm like, I'm 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 old. Yeah. So I'm just what I'm just like, oh, he just flew over the police line. They're just going to let him do that. Yeah. Because if you think about it, anyone could do it. Anyone could just get a glider and dress up as Batman. It's not like he hasn't like a copyright on the suit. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but he's not wearing hockey pads. But he could be. Yeah. From what I've gathered from these three movies is that the uh, Gotham City Police Department is not only useless and incompetent, but fucking dumb. Oh yeah, I I also like that Joel plays into Burton's Gordon mm-hmm. way more. Than, like he's just like, well, Burton made a dumb guy. I'm gonna make him fucking the dumbest. Like, I love like I like, that's one thing. I that's another thing I like about the uh, the rooftop scene, as awful as it is, where fucking Gordon comes up and cock blocks both of them when he's wearing his fucking pajamas. And mm-hmm. like, I saw the signal. What's going on? It's like yeah. you're so clueless. You don't even have access to your own fucking signal. How the fuck did this woman in lingerie get on top of the fucking police station? Yeah. What the, what that's the lingerie is for? All right, yeah. So wouldn't it be cold out? Uh, I'm asking too many. I'm asking too many questions. Yeah. Uh it just it looked very cold, but um, yeah. I just I don't I don't get how there's so many of these interpretations of a useless Gordon, but none of them will make him a drunk. I feel like this one's slightly drunk. No, but like you're fucking. I know he is a hammered alcoholic in yeah. different in different interpretations i feel like i'm gonna watch batman and robin and that's gonna be the one thing they nail is he's fucking like <laughs> he opens his fucking he opens his fucking squad car and just fucking bottles are falling out and smashing and shit like in bad santa yeah god like if they could have if they could have gotten De Niro, that's the role for robert De Niro is drunk gordon mm-hmm. at I, this time in his life i love the um i love 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 the moment when uh so Jim Carrey kills Ed Bigley Jr. Mm-hmm. because Ed Bigley Jr. figures out what, that he's manipulating brainwaves, and uh, he throws him out the window. And Jim Carrey CGI's strictly killing himself. And you know, as we've seen in this movie, ninety CGI looks like dog shit. So, uh, Gore, but Gordon just looks at this awful recording and goes, "Yep, that's definitely suicide." Mm-hmm. Thanks for your help, Bruce. Like, are you that stupid? Mm-hmm. Like, come on, come on, Gordon. Well, I mean, how do, how how would he fake that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's impo- I mean, it's right there, man. Yeah, it's on it's on the, it's on the yeah. screen. But you know, that's the justific- you mean call Batman. <laughs> you know, that's the justification for a lot of that. Those um disproven um crypto videos and pictures, like the Loch Ness monster, which is a hundred percent disproven, and the Patterson Gimli footage, which is contested but very clearly a man in a suit, is people are like, well, how do you fake that? Because mm-hmm. for a long time, people didn't see video or picture or something that you could, like, fake. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's, it's a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Such as putting a guy in a Bigfoot suit and just having him walk, <laughs> walk around the woods. Yeah. Uh, Chris O'Donnell's performance as Robin is actually really good. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, I'm a big fan of Dick Grayson as a character. I know, I don't think Colin is. Uh, objectively, no, he's, he's a really good character. It's just like the Batman stories that I'm interested in. He's not always like featured prominently except for death in a family, but that's not Dick Grayson. Uh, though I, does he show up at that though? No, no, he doesn't. Okay. He should have. That's another story, but so no, I- Dick Grayson is a very good character objectively. Um, if I was making a Batman movie. Which, like, who the fuck asked me? Like, who cares? I would probably not use Robin. But there are ways that he can be used well. And I actually think that uh, most of the Robin scenes, at least up to the third act, so introducing the character and setting him up, 
uh, are actually like some of the best scenes in the movie. I feel like Joel's direction and everything, it just feels a lot more alive and like whimsical and fun and a little more clever when he's on screen. Mm -hmm. So I think he's actually one of the best parts of the movie. Yeah. I mean, I've always been a big fan of the Robin character. It's also because some of my favorite Batman stories are Robin stories. I think one of my, one of my all time favorite, like top ten Batman story, Batman stories, is Robin's Reckoning mm-hmm. from the animated series, mm-hmm. which I think they handle ironically the Robin backstory better than they do here in term. And it's a like Saturday morning kids cartoon. Oh, that one. That's good. Yeah, that's a good one. And they. Uh, I also another another one of my favorite Dick Grayson origin ones is Dark Dark Victory. Mm, of course, it's one of my favorite comic books ever. Yeah, I think that I think that uh, it's also I love one of my favorite Joker comic books. Dark Victory. He's yeah. barely involved. I know, but he's just he's so great when he is. Are you th- are you sure you're not mixing? I think he only has a cameo in that one. But doesn't he have him? Um, uh, he either ha- he has somebody. I think. Um, like dead to rights with a gun and i think it's either i think dick interferes and knocks him out yeah right that's like see that's what like obviously you can do amazing joker stories a lot of my favorite comic book stories are joker stories but if you're gonna have joker as a supporting character it's very easy to fuck that up Mm -hmm. and then having him show up literally the term that he is in that story is wild card where he's like did you forget about me to the audience, like the audience is like, I forgot the Joker was involved in this. Incredible, mm-hmm. and also a great fucking panel. You yeah, know what I mean, I don't know. Hilarious. Why- I fucking laughed my ass off when I read that. I I don't know why I was remembering Long Halloween and that great panel, like mm-hmm. when he, he's first introduced, when he's like, when they cut to that family on Christmas morning, and he's just like robbing them with a gun to their heads. Yeah, oh yeah, amazing. Yeah, uh, two of my favorites, mm-hmm. fucking ever. Yeah, Jeff Loeb, fucking incredible Batman writer. Um. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. It does come more alive with Robin. It kind of makes you think, like, maybe they, you didn't need a love interest in this one. Well. I know, you're thinking the whole Batman-Robin love interest thing. That's the way it's directed. I don't think it is. Uh, when they're when he's showing him his automobiles and stuff, when he's saying, you can put your car in my garage, and then he's, like, showing him all these different things and stuff, there's a subtext going on. There's a subtext. I don't see it. On this I one. I see Usually it. As, I do see it as two two dudes bonding over cars. Yeah, I don't see it in this one. I don't. I don't. Usually, I'm with you on that. Usually, uh, most movies that mean you watch together and you see and, we, and we, we both end up seeing the subtext. Well, this one, I don't see it. It's there. I don't it's, see it. It's there. That's I, think, why I see. I feel it. It's right in here. I think because you watched some WCW wrestling earlier and you got some Sting and Luger mo- action. Don't con- just, don't condescend me, you're, man. You're projecting. Don't condescend you're projecting. me. Projecting. I'm not projecting. I think you're projecting. No, I think so. But uh, yeah. What what so what's your what's your compl- what, like? What do you love about the film and what do you hate? Like, what's your what's your biggest complaint other than probably Two Face because Two Face is god awful because he's just trying to be the Joker. He has no he, he keeps flipping the coin because he doesn't fucking. Oh yeah. They don't they don't implement that whatsoever. They they also like they don't. All right. Well, first of all, they don't set up the coin. I know it's easy to figure out, and ever and most people through cultural osmosis understand Two Face's gimmick, but obviously, you know that the thing, like the coin's gonna land however he wants it to land. You know what I mean? Um, now it depends on like what the character, what type of Two Face is being played. But I've seen different Two Faces where he flips and he gets tails and he needed head, so he just he does like two out of three. You know, he cheats. He does shit like that to sort of you know misconstrue things thereby disproving his own belief that the world is like 50 50 Mm -hmm. like that um you have to set that up and it's also a fun thing to set up is like the coin is going to like land however he wants it to land um you also just don't you don't set up the character appropriately like you should have shown something and i said before in batman returns he doesn't need harvey dent but, like, the fact that it just opens where he's already two-faced and everything, it's just, like, you maybe you don't have to show the origin of him, you know, getting burned or whatever, you know, happened to him. And I know that they go back and they show it later. But just opening it like that, again, feels like a cartoon where it's just, like, he's just at the height of his power and he looks fucking crazy. Um, mm-hmm. So everything with Two-Face, I can't stand. Um a lot of the dialogue I don't I don't really like. I just I don't think it's very like witty and stuff. There's some good one-liners and stuff. Um 
like I said, like the art direction and everything is like really ambitious and I like a lot of the ideas, but I feel like it lacks a certain grit or sort of like contrast that would have really brought the world to life. Uh, I don't like the action scenes because while they're well shot, um, I don't feel like there's any sort of stakes. Again, coming back to the cartoon thing, like a big one is at the end when Batman dives down and saves Chase and then saves the boy. Uh, I never had any doubt that he was going to die, you know, which like for all the criticisms of something like Dark Knight Rises, I actually think he's going to fucking die. You know what I mean? And, like, that's very important. And then, I mean, yeah, you watch something like Back to the Future, which is a great, like, great adventure set pieces. You know Marty McFly's not going to fucking die on camera. You know, it's a PG-13 movie. But you feel that tension because there's, like, grounded and the way it's shot and you have stakes set up. So you feel like he might get hit by a car when he's doing those skateboarding uh, set pieces and stuff. And I don't feel that at all with this shit like the chase and everything where he's going down the hallway or he's going down the alleyway excuse me and you know he like shoots the grapple up and the the um the batmobile just goes up the sides and everything visually it's a lot of fun it looks great and all that stuff but it's also cool when you're in like a setup like that where you feel like maybe there's a chance they could actually get hurt Mm -hmm. you know and like there's really none of that so I, with the movie, I just watch it very passively, and I think that's why I get bored and I start noticing things, like, is Jim Carrey dead behind the eyes? Because mm -hmm. I don't feel those stakes, which also comes into, like, I don't necessarily care about a lot of these characters, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, fucking hell. I don't like the camera work. I, I don't like that Hollywood style of just swinging around constantly where I feel like everything is shot on, like, the same goddamn lens. It just feels very, like... It feels like it's just spinning around a great set piece well, without actually like setting shit up. I don't like that. Uh, what do I like about the movie? Uh, I like Jim Carrey. I like a lot of like the smaller subtext and stuff. I like some of the stuff they were doing with Val Kilmer to try to make Batman more three dimensional. Um, I love a lot of the sound cues and stuff. Uh, I like a lot of like the lighter, more humorous moments. Uh, I love the fucking scene where it starts out so dumb that Robin steals the car, but you know the car the other car and all that stuff. And it's like, it's such a stupid like way to set up conflict and everything. But I loved that. And I loved how he gets dragged into that weird psychedelic, like gang sort of thing environment that's, where that's that right actually... there is where I feel like, I feel like the grit of the movie. And I wish that the movie had been more set on the ground level with that neon spray paint setup and stuff, because I feel like that's one of the best, it's probably the best, like, action scene in the movie. That's what I was about to say. That's my favorite action scene in the film. Yeah, I actually really like that scene. I would have liked the more of the movie built around that. Um, and I think that's about it. I love Alfred. Alfred's also good. I liked him a lot. Batman Returns is my favorite Alfred. That's not Michael Caine playing Michael Caine. But, um, yeah, I liked Alfred as well. I also like the narrative I have, like, built up in my own head that, uh, He's DMing all these blondes after Bruce is done with them at the end of the movie. Yeah, I I agree with you on the Tommy on the Two Face thing. Mm -hmm. I think that like I like I mean I I pitched this last week when I was like they should have had Harvey Dent in a small supporting ish role. Yeah, I feel like the la the previous movie as far isn't you know it's not perfect, but um I don't feel like that was necessary. But then seeing this movie, I'm like could have been good. Yeah, I'm not yeah, saying like he should yeah. be like he's not like a Max Shrek supporting. I'm saying like he's like he's like the level is him as the mayor type yeah. thing, and that's about all you get. And then when the big explosion of the penguin happens at the end, that's where you do it. Mm -hmm. And then and then when you're here, you're like, all right, I get it. Mm -hmm. And but now you know either that or you instead of having the therapist character, you just establish more that Bruce and Harvey are friends, and mm -hmm. you have that, and he he confides in Harvey. Yeah. Well, these things. Then by the end of the movie, you have the two face thing going on. That's something that was always weird too. Is like how he regards Harvey as if he was a former friend of him or is a friend of his, and it's like I understand the timeline. But one, this movie is like very like feels like a soft reboot. Obviously, uh, I know that wasn't like a thing in the '90s, but this is a soft reboot. But also, uh, that ain't Billy D. Williams. It's not. So you gotta like you gotta do something to acknowledge that. Mm hmm. But they don't. You know. Uh yeah, I think like. Well, I also think it's like a thing that I think Tim Burton set up Harvey Dent and then didn't, but also didn't do anything to with it. He was like, "Yeah, Harvey Dent's a thing, and that's it." Mm -hmm. And I think Joel Schumacher was kind of left with like, "Well, I don't know what to do, but everyone keeps saying Harvey Dent's name, and I don't know who he is, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw him in." Because mm -hmm. <laughs> I've always thought like 
the way that to do like a third like superhero movie in your film is always would be like a more interesting way for particularly like a film like Batman Forever when you do like a, a scene like this is like you open it up. It's kind of similar how the Dark Knight opened up, where mm-hmm. like you have, but you have like a but instead of having it like a villain you've already seen, you take like a B list or a C list villain that in the in the Rogues Gallery, like you have a like Calendar Man, yeah, and you beat the fuck oh, out of him. Calendar Man, I like Calendar Man. I Calendar do. Man is a D minus uh, okay. listener of the Rogue Gallery, which is in a way why I like him and why I think a lot of writers feel challenged to um, make him cool. Exactly, and they've done good jobs with that. They actually do that in Batman Begins too with Zaz. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. Perfect. It's so like you don't even notice it when you when you're like, oh shit, that's Zaz. Yeah, you just take a, you take like a minor villain. You have that so that first action set piece with the bank mm-hmm. is like you 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 solve the crime immediately. You just establish that Batman's a badass, but you also have Riddler brewing in the background. Yeah, because I don't think Two Face is really a necessity except for Robin's arc. Yeah, and even then, you could just have the same thing with Riddler. Exactly. And you can just build up Harvey Dent. Yeah. And my biggest problem with the film actually is Harvey is not is not just the two faced performance, is the how it's resolved in the end. Mm-hmm. In the original script, Harvey flips the coin and he can't reach it and he falls by his own on his own. Mm-hmm. Which perfectly goes with Robin's arc of he made the choice to not kill Harvey. He chose not to do revenge because he's learned from Bruce's mistake from killing the Joker. Mm-hmm. But now, in this one, Bruce just kills Harvey. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it doesn't really make any sense. Yeah. It kind of destroys Robin's entire arc, because then Robin would just think, why Why couldn't I have just done the coin? Exactly. And even, like, not that this is what O'Donnell and Schumacher were going for, but you see that long reaction on the close-up of Chris O'Donnell seeing him dead and, like, taking all that in. And in his performance, he's probably, like, the man who killed my family is dead, and I don't feel any better about it. Um but I just imprint my own asshole commentary over his voice where it's just like, Bruce, you dick, I wanted to do that. Yeah. That could easily be interpreted that way. So it's a lot better, especially like the whole live by the coin, die by the coin thing that he literally, you know, you couldn't have changed anything. Mm-hmm. And in the end, you know, it, you know, it worked out, you know, it sort of worked itself out yeah. and you don't feel any better about it. Yeah. Well, like I, said, I think like thematically – and like also in the original script, like not dialogue wise, obviously, but I'm saying like thematically, this is the best of the original series. Oh yeah, I mean a third movie in like a superhero thing is a good chance to do the um the postmodernist take of something where, you know, like traditional storytelling is man versus the world, mm-hmm. and then postmodernist is often like man versus himself, mm-hmm. and they set that stuff up, and it's probably the better stuff in the movie. And I feel like they really could have dove into that by lessening the villains. And by the villains, I mean I mean Harvey Dent and making it more of Bruce versus himself. And that's where Robin comes in because Robin's situation is a foil to Bruce. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing because it's like he gets the opportunity to teach him not to do what I did. Yeah. There's but a- while still trying to like look out for him and all that shit. Yeah. And like I said, in the original version, there is a lot of that. Like uh, there's, in the opening scene, there's actually a deleted dialogue where in a, one of the deleted scenes, like the mm-hmm. longer scene on the helicopter where he's like, you act like you think like you're better than us. Like you're a killer too. You know that mm-hmm. deep down inside, you know, you're just like us, mm-hmm. which is like perfect. And mm-hmm. I'm like, why did you cut this? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, why are we not struggling? He's like, why are we not struggling with the fact that, the, like, it's like Burton set up that Batman's a murderer. Like, all right, it's, well, we want to rectify that. We want to change courses. Well, mm-hmm. let's deal with it. And, like, and like and there's a lot of scenes where he's mentioning, he mentions that he deals with it. And it's just like, I, you know, I go out, you know, I killed, like, you, all you want to do is kill that person that killed your family. And then all, you, you know, but then you do it. And then you go out in the night and find another and another and another. And it's just like, okay, we can keep developing this, mm-hmm. but we just like it's all cut out, and it's very irritating. Release the goddamn Schumacher cut. Speaking of things that Burton set up that they do continue, though, uh, do you pick up on that when Jim Carrey has his product that he's using to like control the thoughts or like suck thoughts out of uh, the population? But they do the framing where he's giving a speech in like that exact same location that Max Schreck did at the start of the movie mm-hmm. of the previous movie, and I want to believe is like the same location they did in 89 as well 
uh, where he's at that booth with like all those microphones and everything. And I'm like, that is the exact same fucking thing again. Yeah. And I'm like, does Gotham have like, like one place where the public can gather to listen to a speech? Yeah, it's town hall. <laughs> it's just so like silly how it's the same thing every single time, but just a different villain. Yeah. I also think that they did the consumer thing better in this one than they did in 89. Uh, sort of, but like the Joker brand thing is one of my favorite Jack monologues ever. And that's just sort of Jack just nailing it with the commercial Mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, I don't know with with this one, it did feel like a little like tacked on where I'm like, why do they need this? I understand like TVs and like next technology or something, but I'm just kind of like, uh, I don't fully get it. It felt a little too high concept. And, and honestly, I just in my idle thoughts sometimes, I just hear Joker brand, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I I like the idea of it more. Maybe it's also because like I love the Joker, but my personal favorite Batman villain is the Riddler. Mm-hmm. Like I love the Joker more as in relation to what Batman is doing. I think that I think that like, but I think that the two need each other. Mm-hmm. Where I think that the Riddler can be a more interesting villain. Mm-hmm. Because he also hasn't been done to death, because he's also very hard to write for. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, you got to write riddles. Yeah, and like I think that, I think that like, I don't think that as of this the release of this episode, I don't think we have had a Riddler in media outside of comics that is perfect yet. Mm-hmm. As much as I love Jim Carrey, I feel like the way to do it is like you do it as like a pseudo Zodiac killer. Well, yeah. Obviously, but like you know, and I don't think the Riddler's riddles are particularly well thought out here. Because if I could get them when I was five, yeah. I could be. You know, they're, they're not. You know, seeing a grown ass Bruce Wayne struggle with fucking yeah. trying to figure out that fucking, it's a match. Watching fucking Alfred yeah. furiously, like drenched in sweat, just like type things on a computer while fucking Bruce screams at him. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the riddles is: Look at the numbers on my face. You won't find thirteen any place. If your answer is anything but a clock, you're stupid. Yeah. Like it's also it's one thing it's like one thing it's instantly you think you know it it's mm-hmm. like even the other one like what was the terror went off scratch my head what was once was red was now black instead obviously it's a match mm-hmm. it's like get fuck fuck out of here yeah I it's didn't even riddles. really like I didn't even like take in the riddles and like that's like a his problem. gimmick yeah I know what is your opinion on the Riddler character because I I know that you're like, uh to ter- terrific potential like potential. I love the he he's like has like an opportunity to be like a great villain for Batman in a way that like Batman could have this great dynamic with him that like Superman couldn't and in a way that's very exciting to me in that he can challenge the detective skills and everything and he doesn't really have any other villain that can do that and the world's greatest detective thing is something that Bruce has that so many other superheroes don't have and don't even need. And that's like kind of everything that like I like about Batman because it has that grounded in reality sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So in a way, this movie is literally the worst movie to do the Riddler in because it's so like almost like fantasy, like high fantasy and stuff, although it does work. But it's kind of not because of his riddles. But like I've said before, like... I just want to watch a Batman movie where he's got to clear out a warehouse that's like a drug lab <laughs> and there's like fucking gangbangers with machine guns and stuff and he's just going to go through taking them out and as he's doing it, he's getting hurt more and more and more because he's like a young dude who's like actually a, like a mass v- vigilante and stuff. There's like a comic I read once. I don't even remember what it is, but he gets like, I don't think it, was, it couldn't have been year one, but it was like in the year one time frame and... He's, like, sneaking onto some property, and he gets hit by guard dogs, and he gets, like, ripped up and stuff, and then he needs to go and take out these people with guns, but he's literally wearing, like, a ninja outfit. It's that gray and black ninja look, Um, and he's, like, bleeding and shit because the dogs have already hit him, and it affects the tension when he actually has to go against the people with guns. Mm -hmm. That's the shit that I love, and in the way, in a world like that, the Riddler could like fucking thrive Mm -hmm. in a way that like the Joker is just pure chaos. The Riddler would work as a great, like lawful evil to Batman's like lawful good, you Mm -hmm. know, not to make, not to oversimplify it because in a lot of ways, Batman is 
uh, a hero, but he's also not necessarily a good person. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always have to be a good person, but the Riddler doesn't always have to be a bad person either. Um, and his fascination with Batman and stuff. There's a lot of potential, is what I'm saying. Yeah. There's potential for things that aren't even a comic book. There are potential for things that are like a novel yeah. with this character. Yeah, I think the Riddler has been done pretty well in other medias as well. Mm -hmm. like, I love I love how they did, did him in the Arkham games. Particularly the first one. Yeah. Well, I also like the one where it's like when he in, the, in Arkham City where he's like – when you do find like he has hostages and stuff, and you actually have to do like a riddle, or your, or the hostages will die, mm -hmm. which I always like. I like that aspect of it. That yeah, that aspect of it is good. One of my it's not even a criticism of Arkham City because you obviously you have to do those sort of fetch quest things if it's just in a video game made in 2011, I think. But um, it is like you know when you first get access to the map. And mm -hmm. you can just sort of see those question marks just everywhere. Yeah. That's where it looks like kind of ludicrous, where it's like, dude, do you sleep? I understand the character probably doesn't sleep, but yeah. it's just the sheer logistics because there are so many of them just out in the open and shit. And it's just like, what the? F it's like clearly a video game mechanic. Yeah. You know, that but being I, said, I, I love doing them. Yeah. They're really fucking addicting to do and stuff, mm -hmm. but like, it does get a little silly. Yeah. But with Arkham Asylum, like, that shit's great because you see these riddles that you can't get to because you don't have the tech yet. And then, and it makes sense why you don't have the tech because you weren't expecting this shit. And then when you go back to those same areas later on in the game, you're able to like actually get to them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I love that. That's like really good storytelling. Yeah. Another Riddler that I love is obviously the animated series one. Mm -hmm. You can't praise them enough. It's probably my favorite Riddler. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. Uh, I also am a big fan of uh, Frank Gorshin's portrayal in uh, Batman 66. Uh, that one is fucking amazing. And if mm -hmm. you haven't heard the um, the novelty single from the 60s where he has a song, I highly recommend using it. And I hope that they use it in The Batman with uh, Paul Dano. Uh, <laughs> Paul Dano is a good choice if I haven't said that. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's yeah. fucking. That's like perfect yeah. choice. That's perfect casting. It's also like if you're gonna use a Riddler in a movie with Batman, you should use him before the Joker. Mm. Just in my opinion, because that's why there was something. Because like that was when I was really involved in like fan stuff and like that shit was post Dark Knight when I was in high school. So you, I'm sure you remember that all the talk was uh, since Heath died. Uh, well, it's got to be uh, either Harley Quinn. Which, without the Joker setting her up, doesn't really work. But it's like, it's got to be Harley Quinn and should be played by Brittany Murphy, who is uh, would be a fantastic choice. She's one of my favorite actors, but uh, then she died. Um, or it's got to be Johnny Depp playing the Riddler. And I love Johnny Depp. And at the time, Johnny Depp was fucking incredible. And in a way, he would be a good Riddler. At least back then, he would have been a good Riddler. But following the Dark Knight, absolutely not. Because it's too close. It's too similar. Like in a way, I mean, unless they do it, unless they do a complete Zodiac way. But even still, it's just it's the way that like what the Joker was almost able to do in Dark Knight, and then like because of like the anarchy aspect of it, going the opposite direction where it's such a personal vendetta against Batman, it just it would it wouldn't have that same tension. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The like the Riddler, obviously, like any comic book villain, can be. Uh, can be the i'm gonna blow up this fucking city if you don't solve this goddamn riddle you know of course he can do that but the way to do it in yeah. a grounded gritty detective sort of way should be a lot more personal it should be yeah. more in the seven sort of way yeah. where it's like i figured out who you are and i'm gonna fucking uh if you don't solve this riddle uh alfred's gonna die and that would be awesome but well, following up dark knight it's like well the joker already covered that yeah, I don't think I don't think they ever. I don't actually. Think, I don't ever think the Riddler is that guy. I don't think he's ever like a, I'm going to destroy the city thing. I've exactly, always, but that's what Edward stupid. Has, that's what stupid movies do, is what I'm saying. Edward Nigma has always been a petty man. Like even here, which is perfect for his character, he's a very like, Edward Nigma's thing is not. Oh, I want to destroy Gotham. I want. I want, He's just like I just want to be smarter than everybody, and I want Bruce Wayne to to be envious of my intelligence. Yeah. Like and, and I like always his thing, and I like all of that. That's how it, like it should be done, and that's why I'm saying to follow up Dark Knight. He was not the he's not the guy to do mm -hmm. it. But, but I would also be fascinated to see Nolan's take on the Riddler. I w I would too, but I would be fascinated to see what Nolan would have done if if Heath hadn't died. Yeah, which may have involved the Riddler. You know, 
He may actually still be making those movies if he hadn't died. Yeah, and we would be spared Tenant. <laughs> We'd be spared a lot of things. He would actually be a, he would have been a good choice actually as a Riddler. Uh, Robert Pattinson. Oh, he'd be just fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I also just like Robert Pattinson as a choice for literally anything. Yeah. I just like the guy as an actor. Yeah. You know? If you haven't watched it, uh, watch Good Time in the Lighthouse. Uh, I'd say that to everybody, and uh, nobody watches Good Time. Me too. I know. I've been saying it fucking since it came out. You, you, you were held back on for like two years, or three years. I remember I, the first time I saw that, it was like when it first came out, and I was just like, oh, you guys see this movie? You're like, ah, yeah. And then you didn't watch it. And I just kept talking about it for fucking like three years until like during the pandemic we had no other choice but to watch it. Well, I think uh, yeah, I think I was looking for uncut gems to watch again or something. I'm like, I'm just gonna fucking watch this one. Yeah. I mean, even still, like I love that movie, uh, but do I enjoy watching it? No. A good time. Yeah. Oh, I think it's a good time. Good time and uncut <laughs> gems are two of my favorite movies in the last ten years that I absolutely hate watching. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, and that's and that's like the best. I knew Uncut Gems was going to be good. Um, I couldn't tell by the trailer. The trailer did not look good. But um, I I knew it was going to be good when the reviews started coming in and they were all either 10 stars or 1 star. And I'm like, all right, this is my kind of movie. And then there are a lot of people giving it like 9 stars out of 10 and they're like, uh, I hated everything about this, but it's really good. Mm-hmm. It's really intense. Yeah. I love the Seasons of Fadi Brothers directed Batman movie. It would, just take, it would take place on one street corner the entire time and just be New Yorkers screaming at each other. <laughs> that, that, that's that, that, that's you should make a Batman movie with the Riddlers, the Safati brothers. Yeah. <laughs> I solved your riddle. Like, you fucking let him go. I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go get a colonoscopy. Yeah. And then he just shoots okay. Batman right in the fucking mouth. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see Kevin Garnett as uh, uh, Killer Croc. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would definitely solve my criticism of this movie where they didn't fucking change lenses the entire film. Mm-hmm. And you just get the Safadi brothers where they use every fucking lens imaginable. Yeah. But yeah, do you do you think that this movie deserves the reputation that it has? I don't know what reputation it has. That it's it's awful. It shouldn't, you know, it's not Batman. It's 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 bullshit and it's one of the worst superhero movies ever made. Well, who who says these things? It has like a thirty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Does even. it really? Uh <sighs> you know, compared to the eighty nine percent on uh for Batman Returns. Well, Batman Returns is a damn fine movie. It is a damn fine so movie. So there's there there are layers I don't like giving like doing film criticism like that. Uh I'm not gonna rate it. I don't that's no, I'm not asking you to rate it. I'm saying yeah. do you think that the legacy that it has I'm saying it's is- a complex question. So let me break it down in a in a series of things. Did I enjoy watching it? It was okay. Uh, <laughs> as a product of its time, uh, 90s sort of kids movie, and I see this as a kids movie. I also see, you know, Jaws and Jurassic Park as a kids movie. It's a kids movie. Uh, I would say that's a, a very, very good because a lot of the problems with it are logical inconsistencies. The sort of thing that people that like the prequels would be like, who cares, man? Just turn your brain off. And it's like, well, I can't because I'm not. Uh, eight years old and I don't like being condescended to this movie didn't feel like it was condescending me but it felt like it was dumb and it didn't know that it was dumb and I kind of respect that so as a kids movie in the 90s very good movie um is it objectively a good movie overall well that's that's where it gets more complicated where I would say that it's (laughs) fuck I would say there are aspects of it that are very good and I would say there are aspects of it from a filmmaking point of view that are uh not not good just just not good the script needed more polish uh the director's vision needed to be stronger i understand the backstory is that he probably had a very strong vision and also i've seen things like probably my favorite joel movie is actually phone booth which is the simplest and like in a lot of ways a dumb movie but his vision is so strong through this that even as a kid and when i was a kid he was considered the worst director in the world uh, post batman and robin i grew up watching phone booth and I'm like, no, this is a very well-made movie. I didn't understand what a well-directed movie was, but I knew that it was this because there is a vision and everything in the movie leads to the vision of that. And I like that. So, uh, no, it's not, it's, not, it's not a great movie. 
but they but i'm glad that it exists and that's what probably what's most important is is it entertaining and is it fun yes uh and i like the contrast that if you're going to go from that burton shit this is kind of the only direction to go although it could have done like they could have done it better uh i'm very glad that it exists uh anyone who takes the fuck i've said this before anyone who takes like the batman shit or just any anything like that that seriously like it's just kind of like you know i i I don't want to like attack it like ad hominem where it's like attack someone personally but you do kind of have to like look at like what the fuck is going on like you know i would be outraged if if they do finally remake the shining or like jaws or something or a movie like that i would get very like that's just wrong it's like in a way sacrilegious uh i would continue living my life you know what i mean uh and I kind of feel that way when people criticize an interpretation of, like, an IP like that. Like, Batman is an IP. And the more interpretations you do with it, the more uh, the character is going to grow and the more the character is going to live. Mm-hmm. Like, I can say, probably, Christopher Nolan watched this movie and Batman and Robin and probably took a couple of things and did his own thing with it. And that's a good thing. Oh yeah, the the, the, you know. the way the way that like the Bruce falling into the hole shit was shot is very very similar. Of course, yeah, with the light and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and wait, even the line too where he says, um, where he says, uh, like it must have been, it was just a part of the grounds, like sort of out there that must have been there forever. Uh, that's Batman Begins. Yeah, and it's like they're right there, and it's like that's that's great. That's a great part of Batman Begins. It's also really probably the one of the best scenes in this movie. Um, and honestly, this is probably shouldn't Batman and Robin. I'm gonna be like fucking Nolan took that, um, and did his own thing with it. No, uh, so, so <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> no, I'm gonna see a couple things. And I'm gonna be like, ooh, ice. <laughs> <laughs> I do yeah. love Arnold, so yeah. you know. I like watching him embarrass yeah. himself. With all the with all the flaws of this film, I think it's I think it's really a really fun action film for like mm-hmm. the nineties action superhero schlock. I think it's I just think it's fun. I think it, it's attempting to do other things. And like I said, really really is a Sch- Schumacher cut. We'll look at this again. Hopefully that all my hype for how good it probably is it pays off. But um I I with Colin I I, I just think that this film does not des- de- deserve the hate that it gets. Mm-hmm. I don't I think it gets lumped in with Batman and Robin, which is entirely yeah. unfair. I think Val Kimmer was a great Batman. I think Chris O'Donnell does a hell of a job. Jim Carrey's great. Nicole Kidman is doing her best. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones is not doing his best. Should have just not acknowledged that. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting. I don't think I ever heard. I've heard people say Batman and Ro- uh, Forever is is garbage. I've heard that a lot. I've never heard anyone really criticize the Two Face character. Now I'm not like deep in the like the no, mm-hmm. but that's interesting because I when people criticize, they criticize Val Kilmer and the bat nipples and the direction of the movie. I've never heard anyone criticize that. In watching this movie, that was the only part that was like actively irritating. Mm-hmm. Like that was the only part that I like really like. Yeah, it's just annoying. It was yeah. just bad. You know, everything else about the movie like isn't irritatingly bad. It's just kind of like whimsically like dumb yeah in, in a good way yeah I, I, I said like val kilmer does not deserve the criticism because he's a phenomenal batman in this film like he is not the problem at all he is one mm-hmm. of the highlights of the film but uh yeah you have anything else to say about the film uh i think that about covers i think it. i know you took a lot of notes i was looking, I was looking over you there yeah um i mean i already criticized the kilmer kidman thing i think that's more the writing uh, i mentioned the I mentioned the dance thing. <laughs> yeah, you did mention the dance. <laughs> Final point is at the end of the movie, uh, Two Face dies, and Batman, you know, uh, well, Ed- Enigma loses his sanity, and he ends up in Arkham Asylum, and that nurse is, or Chase goes in with that nurse. No, oh, it's Doctor Burton. Doctor Burton. And uh, well, first of all, I acknowledge the appearance, and then it's Doctor Burton, and I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and it's like, so before Nigma lost his uh, sanity, he knew who Batman was. Of course, that's the whole point. He's like, he figures it out, and Chase is in there, and she's just like, Edward, you know, who is Batman? 
and he jumps in a frame and he's like, I'm Batman. He's flapping his wings and shit. And she comes out of the asylum and she says to Bruce, yeah, you got nothing to worry about. The guy's fucking crazy. And I remember at that moment, I'm like, see, now here's a creative difference. Because if Michael Keaton had taken that role and this was Michael Keaton's Batman, he would have been like, great, thanks a lot. She leaves. He sneaks in after hours, takes a pillow and just fucking suffocates fucking Edward Nigma. He's like, can't take any chances. Yeah. As if he's not just telling every blonde woman that he meets. Oh, I know. Or, <laughs> or like, maybe the thing that annoys me the most about Batman Returns, when he does the reveal, which, yeah, it's cinematic, but he literally rips his suit off in a way that he can't put his mask back on. And it's yeah. just so stupid. And it's just, you could have covered up, you idiot. You got to get home. Yeah, but literally the people in Gotham are like, you know, Master's like, Bruce Wayne, why he dressed up as Batman? I know. I know. <laughs> like... I know, it's just... It's just <laughs> like, come on. But he's supposed People to be smarter for... than them. I, he is smarter than them. Debatable. It depends how horned up he is. This this Batman is smarter than the Keaton Batman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they do do the detective thing a little bit. That's what, You know, it could have been a lot better, but, like, yeah. you know, he, he is wearing the James Bond turtleneck and pacing back and forth trying to solve riddles that attend like a 10 year old could figure out mm -hmm. um they do they do do that yeah like i said i think this movie also makes an attempt to be the batman of the comics it fails obviously mm -hmm. but you know i think i think there was a good attempt here i love this film i'll continue to love this film and i do prefer it over batman 89 but uh that's gonna conclude this episode of the show next week we're going to talk about batman and robin and uh will probably be the last episode of the show because we won't be able to get through the film yeah so that'll be a, a new experimental thing, never been tested before, called a snuff podcast, where uh, we kill ourselves while recording <laughs> the podcast. Yeah. Uh, so, John, make sure you upload the episode. John does not use a computer. Yeah, on time. Um, but uh, we'll see you next week here. Next, uh, I think this comes out on Friday or Thursday here on Batty for Batman. See you next week. <laughs>